enthusiastically joined us. I know there have been so many webinars and of course there's exhaustion, but I'm also so glad that we are all here together. Uh, every year we celebrate World TB Day and we look back, we take a step back on how the year has been and this year has been absolutely incredible and full of learnings. Uh, I'm so honored to have the panel uh, with us today and I'm going to now just let Mr. Mohan, who's the CEO of the Karnataka Health Promotion Trust, start us off with a welcome address. We are just waiting on Dr. Raghuram Rao to join, who will present, the, of course, the ministry perspective on where TB stands. But uh, just over to you, Mr. Mohan. Uh, joining this webinar. I think uh, this is something very important uh, in the view of uh, observance of uh, World TB Day. Mr. Mohan, would you like to switch off your uh, video? I think uh, there's some bandwidth issue. I'm audible now. Yes, yes. Please go ahead, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as uh, maybe many of you are not aware of KHPT, and KHPT is working in the TB sector from last almost uh, uh, 10 to 15 years now. And uh, we started working in uh, uh, private sector, especially in Karnataka. We started working both in Bangalore and... Here we are. by USAID. Uh, under that, we right, started working with the community. Hello. Yes, Mr. Mohan, please continue. Yeah. Sorry, some disturbance here. Oh, okay, anyway. So we started working uh, 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 one of the innovative project uh, working with the community structure, structures across Karnataka as well as in uh, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Uh, very interestingly, it's the first time in the TB arena that somebody started working with, with the community structure. So we started seeing the entire TB notification, increasing of referral and the community participation through women's self-help group at one end, and also the trade unions and other community level organization involved in addressing the TB. I think uh, we are able to produce very good result by uh, community participation. <sighs> Mr. Mohan. KHPT team, am I audible? You are audible. Okay. I think uh, Mr. Mohan's having some connectivity issues. Mantha, may I request you to please step in and just talk about breaking the barriers briefly? Just a minute, Sukriti. I will, I will request Karthikeyan, okay? Fine. Yeah. Hi. Good evening, all. Uh, good to connect with you uh, in this uh, webinar. Till Mohan, our CEO, gets into the call, a quick update on Breaking the Barriers uh, project, a first of its kind, which will support accelerating elimination of TB in India with uh, community engagement. In our earlier project with uh, USAID support, Tali, we could demonstrate how community engagement can result in increased case notification and the quality of referrals, how it can be improved by a sustainable community engagement. In breaking the barriers, we leverage from our experience in Thali project. We will be working in four different states of India, Karnataka, Telangana, Assam and Bihar, reaching out to different vulnerable populations leaving no one behind, vulnerable population who are at risk of getting missed in TB care cascade, we will be reaching to vulnerable population, 
like urban vulnerable groups in metro and non metro cities tribal population mining workers migrants and tea garden workers these are some of the vulnerable groups which we will be working in the breaking the barriers project we will be using certain behavior change solutions along with community engagement strategies to improve case identification and case holding of these vulnerable population uh, we are uh, planning to reach almost 10 to 11 million vulnerable population in this four year project ctd uh, and uh, state ntp is uh, fully supporting this project and we are uh, happy to join in this webinar to brief uh, about our breaking the barriers project Mohan is back, so he can get into that. Thank you, Sukriti. Thank you, sir. So, sorry, uh, so I'm with due to some uh, meeting. I was traveled to Mysore. I am sitting in University Gandhi Bhavan. So uh, I thought this is a quiet place where I can have without any disturbance. But unfortunately, there is some connectivity issue here. Uh, but uh, uh, with regard to BTB project, Karthikeyan was already briefing. Uh, uh, the entire agenda of the BTB project is uh, to create a model, model with the vulnerable groups to address BTB. Uh, especially the mining population, migrant population. I think uh, migrant is going to be one of the most important uh, 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 group which we are going to work with and create a model with that because we are, uh, 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 I think recently with the COVID-19, we are seeing, seeing the fate of the journey of the migrant population across the country. And also we are uh, trying to redefine the urban vulnerability group as well because we earlier worked uh, with the slums in Bangalore and we came to know uh, in our own experience of working with the slum, majority of the slum didn't have any TB patient. So now uh, due to the migrant the, uh, mm, uh, in the urban as well as the core Bangalore as well as the outskirts of the Bangalore, the entire living uh, uh, condition is completely changed. And we need to identify different group, both at the workplace as well as their staying place as well. So we are already done a mapping in Bangalore and other cities as well. We are already working with the mining population, the Sandur and other places. Bihar, we are working in the migrant tea planter, uh, plantation workers in Assam and also the tier two cities. I think these are the five, six urban population which we are trying to work as part of the BTB project. Because you all know that unless the is part of the TB initiative, I think it's in a dream to eradicate the TB from... Uh, 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 by 2025. So our objective is to address the unreached population and also with the last mile connectivity that how we can reach all these vulnerable population to address the TB program. I think today uh, with the great uh, uh, people who have a lot of experience in this, uh, 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 good to have Dr. Rajiv Gowda. I think uh, I know the uh, uh, being uh, from Bangalore, uh, knowing uh, him and the entire family. Uh, I think uh, his father was the one of the instrumental uh, in the Devarajar's government on addressing the poorest among the poor, the tenant, uh, the Land Reform Act was popular. I think the entire family is involved on or the other way, addressing these kind of in a very, very vulnerable and poor population with the great his experience in IMB and world over. I think he'll give a lot of insight uh, today's discussion. And also, uh, Dalbi Singh, I think uh, great to have you again. Uh, we had a, uh, recently we had a chat in one of our meeting and uh, Mr. Chandan and also uh, uh, Lucica uh, and also giving your time and the entire team, Dr. Ruben, I think uh, one of the uh, 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 motivator and supporter being from the medical background, he's always, his mind and heart works in the community. And uh, uh, Mr. Raghuram Rao, no doubt, he's always supportive for any new innovations and innovative. I think I wish uh, success and also today's deliberation will be useful to work with the community structure across five states where we are creating a model and innovations. Thank you very much for this and welcome for all. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Mohan. And uh, on that note, I'm going to proceed uh, with the panel because Dr. Rao would try to join us in a little bit. Uh, the teams are, I think, uh, heavily engaged around World TB Day, but he will be here at some point later. Uh, we'd love to hear from him at that point. I'm going to just uh, go into the panel, but before I do that, uh, there is something interesting we are trying at this webinar. So I'm going to ask uh, the team that's supporting us to pull up the first poll question. And how this works is this is open for the participants. Please take 15 seconds to vote on the question that's going to come up on your screen in, in a few seconds. And uh, as you keep voting, we'll keep discussing this. And the purpose is to understand how we are thinking as individuals and organizations. Can we have the question, please? While the question's coming up, uh, I'm going to start. Hello, Dr. Rao. Hello, Dr. Rao. Okay. I'm going to just start uh, while the question comes up on the screen. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing the panel. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Rajiv Gowda, who is an Indian politician and an academician. He is a former member of parliament in the Rajya Sabha and a national spokesperson for the Indian National Congress. He also currently serves as the chairman of the Congress Research Department. He was professor of economics and social sciences and the chairperson of the Center for Public Policy at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and taught a range of courses. He served as the director of the Central Board, Reserve Bank of India, and is currently the advisor for Bridge India, a progressive nonprofit think tank set up in London in 2018. Dr. Dalbir Singh, who's been uh, with us on many conversations and has been a guide, is the president of the Global Coalition Against TB. He is well respected in the international arena of TB and has been invited to speak on many international conferences on issues related to health and development from an Indian perspective. Dr. Singh has also spearheaded some of the most critical policy changes in the landscape of tuberculosis. Dr. Rubin, who will be joining us shortly, is the chief of the Infectious Diseases Division, USAID. He is a public health professional with extensive experience in the development sector, having worked closely with a wide array of stakeholders in India, including donor agencies, UN organizations, Government of India, MOHFW, as well as Niti Aayog. Dr. Lichika Dithyu is a Romanian physician and public health expert who has devoted her career to helping and supporting people affected by TB, especially those most vulnerable, most stigmatized, and living in impoverished communities. Dr. Dithyu has led the Stop TB Partnership for the last eight years, and it is under her leadership. The organization has gained a clear identity and evolved into a lean, innovative, and progressive team. Last but not the least, our champion voice for today, Chandan BK, born and brought, him, brought up in Tumkur, is a telecommunication specialist, engineering from Bangalore Institute of Technology. At present, he is an IT professional and most importantly, a TB survivor and a champion. Before we start the panel, uh, would the, the team like to pull up the poll and the answers so we can have a look, please? So the first question that we asked today to everybody who's in the audience is that what, according to you, are the biggest barriers to access TB care? And as we can see, majority of the people are talking about the distances to facilities. And this is something we are going to talk about, not only from a policy perspective, but from realities from the ground and also lack of information amongst patients. And today we hope to walk away with some solutions from the panel about how we can address both these. Thank you so much. With that, I'm going to uh, just, Dr. Rao, can you hear me? Dr. Rao? Hello. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Uh, I'm audible, please. Yes, you are, sir. Yes, you are. Uh, 
Uh, I am Dr. Ravinder Kumar from Central TV Division. Dr. Rao is in meeting with additional secretary. So I am joining this meeting. Come on, sir. 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 Sorry for this mess. I've been jumping around meetings. But, no problem. Uh, happy to be here. Happy to Thank be you. here. And, uh, so happy to see Dalveer Singh, sir. Namaskar, sir. And uh, yeah, yeah, Namaskar, sir. So, so great to see. I mean, uh, lots of activities happening, a renewed uh, you know, mission for us to take forward the TB agenda for uh, you know all the impact that it had last year. It's, uh, it's very important that we have focus uh, at least in the next year, not just to recover, but also go forward, you know, so that we are able to achieve because 2025 at the close of an eye, they're going to have it in front of us. And uh, you know, it's, it's going to be very, uh, very challenging. And we hope that uh, you know, with the uh, contribution and support from all partners, especially the communities, you know, so, so it's going to, you know, take this entire TB movement into, a, uh, you know, a people's movement. Uh, you know, Jan Andolan or a TB Mukh Bharat campaign that we are, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, announce and uh, take forward all these activities in the next year. You know, that's going to be the key focus. And like the country has given a response to COVID, that's the response that we want to give for TB, you know, in the next year so that we, we go forward in our, uh, you know, in our fight. And uh, community, of course, you know, has been an integral part through this journey. And it becomes more important in the subsequent years when, uh, you know, in, uh, when we, we would want to sustain the behavior change, you know, the COVID appropriate behavior, because that's extremely important for us to sustain that so that, uh, you know, the, uh, the community transmission dynamics change. So we are hopeful that it will change and our community will sustain that. And we, we are, you know, we are banking on our uh, community, on our community structures and the support that they can provide to us right? and uh, the civil society organizations they they are working with us uh, in very uh, you know targeted areas uh erstwhile but uh, we're also going to get a global fund grant which is going to focus a lot on communities and these grants will help us reach certain key vulnerable populations you know especially migrants uh truckers homeless population slums my you know in these sectors so it's going to be something which would be a focus for next year and uh, i'm sure you know with the with the support of everybody will uh, will achieve our goals you know so Thank thanks for hosting this and uh, you know uh, sorry for all the incon inconvenience caused <laughs> I think COVID has taught us how to deal with all the smallish errors that come up. But thank you for taking the time, sir. And just uh, taking uh, your lead, I'm going to actually now jump into the panel with the panelists who have joined us today. Uh, I'm going to start with Dr. Dalbir Singh. Uh, sir, uh, looking at the global policy recommendation space, the WHO recommends that deeper community engagement by providing policy and programmatic guidance should be an important component of our endeavor in eliminating TB. Could you share your thoughts on this, please? Uh, Sukriti, thank you. Uh, let me touch a couple of very fundamental things to begin with. One is we are 1.3 billion people and uh, like any other country with our kind of population setting, our governments are too far removed from people. Okay, there is a huge gap, not only in terms of distance, in terms of services, in terms of reach, in terms of access, in terms of even imagining things, it's too far. I mean, like I always tell people, we have parliamentary constitutions in India, the population is more than population of Norway. So, you know, it's, it's as bad as that. So despite all stellar efforts, health systems, the world over, of course, not only in India alone, one third of the people who have been able to develop TB have been missed, okay, either in terms of not getting the diagnosis across, or they have been diagnosed but not reported, or not in the cycle of uh, the process of treatment. And similarly, in India as well, we call it the million missing, okay, after so many years. And th there is something wrong. The wrong is that we, the treatment, the, the process of healthcare must reach people. And the only way they can reach people is when they, we 
close this gap. And who will fill this gap is the communities. The community is very, very imperative, very, very integral to our uh, overall planning of ending TV by 2000. Because apart from all this, what, what is, because as far as TV is concerned, it's at social, political, and economic level. Okay, at social level, there are very larger issues driven in our society. Societal issues like stigma, discrimination, ostracization within the community, at the workplace, it becomes virtually impossible to live in village. You know, the, the divorce rate after getting TV is in the region of about 18 to 20%. And there are people who left isolated in society is another 16%. And uh, so many rejected by the in-laws, another 12 to 14%. So it's, it's a huge amount of people who kept out of the system and they don't, they can't access healthcare. Therefore, community is very important because fostering community, you know, it allows contextualization it allows the adaptation of health intervention in a better way. It facilitates larger participation and strengthens your mission to end TV. It strengthens institutional platform at all levels. It deepens your engagements with affected communities, the NGOs, the civil societies. It also strengthens patient support mechanism. And more than anything else, it also increases huge amount of psychological comfort of TV survivors. Survivors themselves become your champion and they'll fight your battle. But firstly, who will make him comfortable? If he's isolated in his own society, in his own little group in a village, there's nothing he can do to contribute to doing something for the society apart from looking after his own interest. Similarly, even in terms of improving delivery of services, awareness, and even knowledge about the government schemes, initiatives, and opportunities. And I think, uh, it's a better deal incorporating innovations, indigenization, you know, incorporating even technical advances better if they're done in a decentralized way, okay, right down at the grassroots level. Then monitoring our protocol treatment mechanisms and uh, even, you know, building coalition with Panchayati Raj institution now that we have, I'll, we'll, I'll come to that later, at right up to the village level, district block and village level. Because most of our health centers, sub-centers, or even primary centers, are referral centers. So with the PRI, if some sort of a synergy is built tomorrow. I've been talking about it all along. I've, I've written these recommendations to the ministry numerous times. And I'm sure in days to come, we will find if we have to really make Jan Andolan a success, NTB by 2025, we'll have to bring synergy between all these organizations. And then WHO itself consider this has one of the four cardinal principles to, to end TV strategy, you know, in which engaged TV is a very important uh, parameter. And they have tried, let's, let's also learn from some of the interventions. You know, tried globally, in countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, where human effort, effort has reached, you know, underserved nomadic and migrant communities. In Tanzania, they use mobile technology. In South Africa, they're strengthening the reporting mechanism. And like that, four more countries are being have taken on board by uh, WHO to try this experiment. And uh, India has a huge opportunity by strengthening our community, local communities engagement. And I'm sure in days to come with their synergy, we'll be able to have greater outcomes. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. And uh, it is true that TB thrives in community and therefore community action is indispensable. Uh, from that, I would like to just zoom a little bit from a, from a global to a more national view of the TB landscape. We do know that, of course, TB causes a huge loss. Not only does TB have uh, detrimental effects on the personal health of uh, the person who is infected with it, but the burden ultimately is on the national GDP as well. Uh, Dr. Gaura, would you like to elucidate on what have been the financial implications of TB for India? Dr. Gaurav, could you kindly unmute? The implications are at multiple levels. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Dalbin Singh was just pointing out, you know, there's a huge impact on individuals themselves and their ability to earn, to participate, and to contribute to, um, uh, to the economy. But all, and all that adds up in terms of lost opportunity. And of course, on the individuals themselves, um, uh, the continuing impact 
that happens because they're not able to even access um, uh, healthcare and regular care, which is what um, uh, TV actually requires. Now, um, of course, the government is not staying silent. It's basically come up with uh, an action plan. We've got a target, you know, by 2025. We've got to, um, uh, and, and there are some very interesting incentive schemes which are ensuring that pro healthcare providers will, um, uh, you know, will will, will provide financial support to patients to come and um, get treatment and things like that. But all of these will add up. And this is where the, you know, the national budget is something that we need to look at very, very carefully because um, uh, you know, every year and every political party keeps talking about a certain level of aspiration for what we want, what percentage of the GDP we want to allocate towards health. But every budget disappoints. And uh, this, you know, that's just because of the nature and scale of the problem. The, the real challenge is that you know, when you have a quarter of the world's TB population, when, um, when as, you know, in India, when you have the danger that, um, uh, you know, that, that, you know, with all this uh, uh, health impact and with, you know, with, with uh, you probably see a few billion dollars worth, you know, we call ourselves a $2 trillion economy. Well, at least $3 billion is an estimate, a small, you know, maybe an underestimate of the annual economic cost. Or, or to the Indian economy of um, uh, tuberculosis. And this is going to be more of a challenge because uh, there are two, three factors I want to just highlight. One is drug resistance uh, TB, right? So basically if you, uh, like uh, during this year when you had um, a treatment being disrupted as a result of lockdowns and, uh, you know, and, and uh, migrant movements and things like that, you, you actually have the danger that it, things will actually worsen for patients which means even more resources are going to be required. Second, you've seen um, uh, reports that have come out in, um, in recent times talking about levels of nutrition worsening in India. Now, you know, the worse you have nutrition indicators, the more vulnerable uh, you know, people are to TB. And, and so this is something that's going to affect even children. So this is, again, another uh, dimension that we need to think about. So basically, when you, when you take, uh, and, and then, of course, you need a lot of resources allocated to communication, to spreading the word, to removing the stigma. So, so I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the organization like KP, uh, Karnataka, um, Health Promotion Trust and in multiple states, they are uh, working on trying to make an impact, but this is a disease that's nationwide, worldwide. And um, uh, I would uh, think that the, the, we need to keep up the pressure on the government to keep um, uh, funding, uh, you know, the, the uh, TV, TV control programs adequately. Now, when other crises like COVID emerge, then you can see TV taking a backseat and that's not appropriate even from the point of view of TB patients, because uh, you know their lungs are already compromised, and therefore they will be even more vulnerable to COVID. So you know, uh, so, so when you think about all these different dimensions, and I don't think I've covered everyone, um, you basically have um, a very major ongoing financial challenge, uh, you know, and a much more looming financial challenge to the country. And one of the things that we know is that. Um, in the context of healthcare, we know that for all the effort that governments have put in to bring people and families out of poverty, it takes just one mega illness to fall right back into below the poverty line. And so in the context of TB care, interventions, support, financial um, uh, you know, uh, interventions, et cetera, much more priority, I think, needs to be given or priority should not be lost. And all of these multidimensional approaches, we must uh, ensure that uh, they continue to be high on um, the national list of priorities, that adequate funding um, it continues to be devoted. Um, and and community-related interventions actually can um, uh, make a huge difference. And I think a combination of all these factors um, uh, backed with finances will uh, really um, uh, help turn the tide. Thank you, Dr. Gora, and I completely agree with you. And I think everybody who's listening in, the priority should not be lost. I think we've taken some big steps towards addressing TB as an issue. We need to keep at it and with increased allocation, hopefully get to the goal of elimination. 
I'd like to take a second to welcome uh, Dr. Ruben Swamikin. Uh, welcome to the conversation. Uh, glad to have you with us. <clears throat> In the first focus area, I'm going to pose the next question to you, sir. Based on the learnings from USAID's work, what do you think is the role of the community structures and informal networks in meeting the Eliminate TB goal, especially from India's perspective? Uh, thank you, uh, Sukriti, and uh, a very good afternoon from uh, India and uh, uh, here for the rest of you all, especially I can see Dr. Luchika there. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning to you and Dr. Dalbir Singh and Dr. Gowda as well. Uh, so firstly, you know, thank you for having me here. And I think uh, as we go through this processes, right, the community is probably the backbone on which all of this lies. And you know, I I just came out of a six-hour meeting that we just had with another partner of ours, and you know there were about 40 TV champions in the room, and you know my heart just swelled with pride that you know we 10 years ago this was something that we didn't talk about, it was always top down, right? As a doctor, I'm telling everyone else this is what you're supposed to do, and there is no argument, and I don't care about your point of view. Today we are actually in a room with them; they are having center stage. We are listening to their problems and we are now trying to find solutions based on what it is they want. And I think to me, there's a paradigm shift in what a community structure should look like. The community defines itself. It's not for us to define them, right? And so with that, I think really we are seeing now such tremendous, tremendous change. I mean, there were such heart-wrenching stories of MDR-TB patients who are on the verge of suicide, right? But today they are on that platform there in a hotel talking boldly about how they overcame something like this, which is, which is unimaginable. And I think this is the kind of community structure, you know, other than the physical and you know the need for drugs and diagnostics and all of that, but just the power of the people and how that can change things is really tremendous. And I, I think I also want to uh, put in a word here for the government of India, as the Honorable Ministers announced the Janandalan for TB, uh, it's it's going. To, it's basically a people's movement, and you know what I saw today was just so heartening that I think really, you know, we'd probably make a huge dent if not actually reach the goal of 2025. So it's pretty impressive, and I think uh, you know one of the community members also said nothing uh, for us without us. It's an old HIV adage, but it it works very well for TB as well. And so I think you know. How do you empower them? I think we've, we've taken multiple steps from the very beginning. I've seen maybe about three years ago that they were so scared to even speak into a microphone. Today, you had a lady saying, when is the next vaccine for TB coming? How come COVID has a vaccine, but we don't have a vaccine for TB? This is coming from a TB champion, not from a renowned scientist or anybody. right? And so I think this is really where the challenge is, and this is what they're pushing for. And they've found ways to support other patients, they found ways to work with the government, access the services. So for example, someone mentioned that DBT is not available completely, right? Somebody gets one month of 500 rupees and then nothing after that. Somebody has completed treatment, but they've got nothing as yet, right? And then somebody is saying, you know, where is our rights in all of this, right? How do we actually claim this as our right? You know, and it was just such enthusiastic discussions and I think the next step now is to empower them with solutions, right? They're good at asking the question, which is where they are now. We've now got to empower them with solutions. So not only are they going to help themselves, they're going to help other TB patients and the community at large. Uh, because I think, you know, even the uh, uh, Honorable Prime Minister mentioned a few you know, weeks ago that you can't be dependent on the government systems alone to solve all your problems, right? So if you can give them a structure by which they can provide, not only for themselves, but for everyone in their community, I think we're going to make a huge change. So to me, really, I'm just so buoyed today simply because of that event. And to just come into this and actually talk about it is really you know, exceptional. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. And it is truly uplifting, and especially for people who worked in TB or who have survived TB. I think, uh, you know, the term power of the people and let's start listening to them, be guided by them. I think stands absolutely true. On that note, I'm going to turn to Dr. Dittu. And uh, uh, ma'am, would you like to just share your experience from the Stop TB Partnerships collaborative approach and all the steps that you've taken in the past for all the programs that you've led so beautifully 
And what can we learn from them about addressing TB in India, taking the community structures along? Yeah, so thank you. First of all, this is really great that we are uh, that we are all together here. Uh, a lot of uh, good uh, friends around the table. So obviously, uh, you, Sukriti, but uh, Dr. Dalbir, and obviously you, Ruben, and uh, everyone else in the room. It's impressive also the audience that uh, you have, uh, considering that it's afternoon. There are, I think, around 200 people online. So that's uh, really remarkable. And thank you for taking the time. So you see, um, you, uh, I agree with Ruba. I mean, I agree with everyone uh, that spoke, obviously, because everyone is constructing on each other. But I, I want to say, I want to emphasize what Ruben said, you know, that few years ago, I think even like as, as early as six, seven years ago, we were uh, really trying to get one or two survivors per country. We had millions of people affected by TB, but we were unable to get more than one or two. And this one or two are usually engaged as a, as a figurehead to say their story. You know, that was their contribution. Usually you, you invite a TB survivor to say, um, uh, you know, to say their, uh, their story, not to really be engaged, not to be uh, empowered. So what we uh, start, so we had few things that we were pushing as uh, Stop TB Partnership very hard and engagement of communities and also discussing communities' rights, gender, stigma. We put it at the core of our work and what we worked on different plans uh, and in, on different areas. And I think it contributed a lot uh, the, the way in which it was structured. And obviously the main contribution was from USAID uh, and, and really uh, the transformation in engaging, in com engaging communities in delivering services is centered on the vision of USAID. And uh, the TB Accelerator launched in 2018 contributed a lot to that but also a global fund with whom we work extremely close. So basically we developed, first of all, a set of tools to be able for the programs to look and understand our communities engaged. Can we do an assessment of our program? Is it based on the rights of people? Can we look if the gender is properly addressed? Not necessarily meaning just women or girls, but in general, are, our, are the services gender sensitive? Are they taking into consideration the different gender aspects and so on? As well as stigma for which we developed for each of these specific tools to assess and see what's the situation and also try and identify what are the solutions to be put in practice. So that's, that was one track. There was another track that basically looked at creating networks of civil society and communities, survivors and people that uh, can be, um, uh, how to say, the, some of our warriors, okay, like we see right now. And it was not just a solely Stop TB partnership thing. A lot of partners worked on that in such a way that we have now global networks, regional networks, and a lot of national networks of people that are able to be uh, engaged and involved in uh, advocacy, but also in, in program delivery and so on. And the third piece, which is not uh, in order of priority, which I think is extremely important and is basically working in parallel with other things that uh, USAID and the Global Fund also are doing, but mainly USAID, is empowering local organization to deliver their, uh, their work. And um, we did that for many years through Challenge Facility for Civil Society, which is a, a funding mechanism for really grassroots organization. And uh, is now this facility is blooming. You know, we have now $7 million that we will launch this year in grants and so on, which is a big amount. But also this money helped a small grassroots organization not uh, only to deliver on the programs, and I will say something on that, but also getting the, I would say, the guts and the power to become grantees for bigger, for bigger donors, you know, like Global Fund and the others, because usually, these big donors are looking a bit uh, skeptical into funding a small organization that never spent uh, too much money but uh, in that. So they look for big uh, organizations to be the main recipients, which I think we should really look at that globally much more uh, because uh, the real work and the real engagement fr comes from these organizations that are on the field and know very well their work. And here come what I want to say is Stop TB, since uh, it's already, there are several months, we decided that most of our funding, if I, we would like all of it, to go to organizations from the high burden countries. We will not fund any more countries that are coming, let's say, from the big north, because uh, we think that the solutions 
the minds and the work is staying in the communities and it's not a parachuted solution from a different uh, country coming and being implemented in a country. So that's why that's our approach. It's part of this entire discussion, but I don't want to go into it of the decolonizing the global health. We are not speaking that much. We want to do it. You know, we want to ensure that the funding goes there. And here I just uh, touch on my last point, <coughs> which is related to TB and COVID. You see, and this link to what Ruben said and Dr. Dalbir and so on. <coughs> it's very important that, you see, to address COVID, we realized that we didn't have the right tools and the right people in place. A lot of uh, things, looking even globally, not necessarily India, were constructed on what COVID, what TB uh, de de deployed, you know. A lot of the staff that was doing TB became to do COVID, a lot of the hospitals, some of our diagnosis tools, some of the contact tracing. Now, what needs to happen, and India did that and is doing that, but it can be uh, scaled up, is at the community, having the community health workers, but also these networks of civil society and communities and so on at, at that uh, community level as entry points for information, for demystifying wrong uh, statements, for convincing people to get diagnosed and treated. So what is needed is having a, a network already created, okay, are there 30 people in a community that can be trained quickly on the information? They have already a background. Can they be equipped further with, obviously, with PPE and other things, but also with the right information? Do they have already the entry channels in the community and they know people there? They can go to them either house to house or gather them. This kind of network that is really very well created at the grassroots level will help not just with TB and COVID, will help with any future pandemic coming. And uh, if you want to be, uh, you know, it's like, okay, we cannot give up to these people everything. They can be very well equipped with information around airborne diseases because TB and COVID are both airborne pathogens. If we want to be protected for future, there are several things that can be done for both of them and as well can stay for other airborne diseases that might come, hopefully not. So in empowering and giving in a way them the responsibility, but also the right tools, the right information and also the some remuneration, obviously, that they become in a way the drivers of, they, they are not only, they are communicators, but they also uh, uh, delete all these walls that usually are between people and the public health sector. If, if these kind of networks can be created and exist and can be further empowered, will be extremely useful. So I will stop here because I spoke a lot. There will be funding opportunities from the Global Fund and others with the COVID opportunity, uh, you know, and that's why that funding should be accessed but also it will be very important to think smart and use it not just for COVID, you know, if there is PPE equipment, buy for all the health community workers that are needed over there and so on and so on. So thank you so much for this, uh, for this great opportunity. I actually enjoy the conversation very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ditu, and so have we, and some amazing words and the commitment that you want to fund the smaller organizations in the developing world is really empowering. I'm sure there are organizations and individuals who are listening in very carefully to that. Uh, from that perspective, I just want to turn to uh, Dr. Singh, who has tried to break the wall between you know, policy and it reaching the ones who matter. Dr. Singh, you have been heading GCAT uh, with the support of policymakers like uh, Dr. Gowda for over a decade. Uh, in your view, can local governments be incorporated to strengthen grassroots and strengthen community engagement to combat TB? So can you unmute, please? Sukriti, I've been shouting from the top of my voice since last seven years that we are a very fortunate country that we have constitutionally mandated local governments in India. And 73rd and 74th Amendment ushered into formation of those governments. And if you vaguely remember Rajiv Gandhi, when he was prime minister, he used to feel, and when he made that statement, which was not correctly quoted, what he really meant was that every 100 rupees of central funds, of federal funds that are sent to the states, only 15 
rupees worth of benefit rate is there. So there was a lot of leakages. That's why these these amendments were brought about so that we have local institutions. Today we have 250,000 of them. 3.2 million people are elected every five years. We, you have local government at the district, at the block, taluk, and also at the village level. And with these institutions, we can create a phenomenal structure. Of course, even considering that in the last few years, uh, not so much of uh, um, uh, empowerment has been done by the state governments or by even the federal government, but now it, panchayats are under the state, so it's pretty predominantly now that it's for the state to utilize them. So all uh, empowerment, utilization of funds, giving them power to levy taxes, and, and understandingly, healthcare, public health is one of the fundamental responsibilities of local governments. You know, it's an obligatory function. And even then, they are not being used. Of course, there seems this dichotomy of interest between that maybe Mr. Goda can make a comment on it later. Why? Against China. China spends 11% of the GDP on local government. India spends only 2%. And we have such remarkably talented and skilled people. Well, there are there can be certain cases where they, they lack capacity, but they can be trained. But given the kind of healthcare needs of India today, given what we have seen during the COVID in the last 16 months, we have to strengthen our local governments. We have to create a synergy between the local governments and also the government apparatus, and also the local community, also civil society. And unless we bring a total synergy between all of them, it, we will not be able to reach target by 2025. Because with 2.50, I mean, it's two and a half lakh people, elected bodies, elected. I mean, I, I'd gone to Australia a few years ago, the entire Sydney town, Adelaide, they're all being done by local governments. They're not even constitutionally mandated. And in India, there are numerous examples in Kerala, Karnataka, Maharashtra, where these people have done remarkably well. Even in Orissa, there are Rogi Kalyan Samitis. You know, they are like peripheral decision-making composite health units. And with, with their effort, the accountability and transparency has in governance has improved, quality of services has improved, delivery of services has improved, and local responsiveness has become remarkable. And entire intersectoral coordination and integration that is required at the lower level, at the grassroots level, can only come by utilizing these organizations. Because government's outreach is limited. We, we can have half a million growth centers, we can have 24,000 microscopic centers. We have also treated 16 million people. I, I mean, I, there is a lot that the government in India has done. But like I said in my earlier part, 1.3 billion people. Let's look at the figure. And we have 28% burden, 30% modernity of the world. We cannot afford not to use these bodies when they're available to us. Why didn't we create these institutions if we're not going to use them? So I told the health minister last time also at the National TV Forum meeting that Ministry of Panchayati Raj has to be deeply involved in it. Health ministry alone cannot do it. And we have to bring synergy between the panchayats and the TV structures of the government. And we also have to engage the communities. We have to engage the civil society. And when we say engage civil society, we have to give them due respect. We have to bring some sort of legal and administrative framework. We have to treat them as equals. Then only we can get a little more response from them. And many national governments and global institutions after COVID experience have started investing very heavily in resorting to process of decentralization. And I'm sure we would not overlook this imperative as world's largest democracy. Because larger objective of affordable, equitable, and universal health healthcare can only be achieved if you build synergy between the government operators, local governments, society, deeper engagement of local communities, and under supervision of our elected representatives at every level from parliament to cooperate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And uh, thank you for all the work and leadership that you have shown to us uh, as a nation over the last decade. Uh, I'm just going to turn this slightly towards the public health structure, so to say, because that becomes the point of access for many, many lakhs of people. 
Dr. Rubin, I'd request you to come in here and uh, tell us how can we improve the status of public sector health services catering to the vulnerable and marginalized populations in resource poor settings, especially from the perspective of tuberculosis? Uh, thank you, uh, Sukriti. I think, uh, you know, uh, even you know, before we start thinking about what needs to be done, I think we need to look at what's in existence. And I'll, I'll give a few examples, and you know, maybe others can build on that. Uh, you know, one is the health and wellness centers, right? The health and wellness centers now is the closest point of contact uh, for you know a village, right? And you know, the, uh, to be able to develop that, and you know, USAID has actually uh, put together a training for the community health officer who is in charge of the health and wellness center on TV. Now, the, the uh, health and wellness center may not have uh, the capacity to diagnose TB, but at least they'll be have the capacity to be able to transport this sputum for examination, all right? ensure that the result comes back in the fastest uh, possible time. And uh, once the patient is started on treatment, uh, provide the kind of treatment adherence support that would be required for the patient. So, you know, these are existing structures that can be reorganized to be able to provide the support that you want, right? So, so, so that is one, and I think we're seeing, uh, you know, a, a lot of uptake. You know, uh, USA is working with around thirty thousand uh, health and wellness centers over the next three years. Uh, we've, uh, you know, already started engaging with them and training them. That is one. Two is, uh, you know, working with the TB champions. Uh, the TB champions themselves are from the community, and so the opportunity in enabling them or empowering them to be able to be this bridge between the community and the health system, uh, again, is an eye-opener in the sense that you now have this organized group of people who know what they're talking about, who can establish that link and be of benefit to TB patients and the communities, right? So not only are they bringing in the kind of services that are available with the government, they're also taking the problems of the community to the government to be able to find those solutions. And I think that's that's really now changing the paradigm. And I think for the government itself, they're, they're obviously you know, struggling with the kind of manpower that they have. How much of manpower you have, it's, it's not going to be enough. But with these people, with the community at every district, every village who's willing to take on this responsibility, suddenly their manpower is increased many fold. And really then, especially for TB, you'll see that you know, you're able to get a lot of uh, benefit from them, right? I mean, you have the ASHA workers. You know, look at the self-help groups, right? The self-help groups have played a dramatic role in providing that kind of support, right? And so now we're looking at these TB champions to be the next big force in being able to bridge that gap uh, that the system uh, struggles to make with the patient. And so I think, you know, this is uh, really uh, in terms of how we should start looking at structures that exist Yes, we'll bring in newer structures. There will be innovations. You know, you'll bring in artificial intelligence methods and all of that. But really to look at existing structures and existing community members who are willing to take this on is going to be crucial in, in seeing the change that's going to happen. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Samikin, and completely agree. And uh, with that, before we move into the last focus area for today's conversation, I can see lots of uh, attendees are raising hands and uh, I welcome everybody to leave questions in the Q&A box. We are gonna take this up in about 15 minutes from now. Uh, please do leave your comments in the main chat and the questions in the Q&A. Before we move to focus area three, uh, there is a second poll question that I would request everybody to take 15 seconds to answer. And then I'm going to move to Dr. Gora for the focus three first question. Can we have the question up, please? So we've been having conversations about, you know, access, information, awareness, uh, and you know, these are recommendations from the audience who have who have tuned in. What can be the enablers to access TB care? It is absolutely true. Complete and correct information about TB services. Where to go? how to reach them, and what is the quality that is required, both for diagnosis as well as treatment completion. Thank you so much. With that, I'm going to move to focus area three. Um, before COVID-19 became a global pandemic, India was dealing with another much older epidemic of TB, which as we know has affected millions of people globally and especially in India. I would now like to shift the conversation a little away from TB policy and more to the current scenario. Uh, Dr. Gaura, 
Does our response to COVID-19 tell us the system can respond better to TB as a health crisis? Your opinion, sir? Well, um, the COVID crisis is still ongoing and we seem to be on the verge of a second wave. So there are no easy verdicts on how well we've responded. However, the basic fact is that the system has responded and the system has responded uh, with tremendous political will, with tremendous um, uh, synergy between different uh, governmental, non-governmental, local governmental and um, uh, extension um, uh, entities all coming together. And um, also with, um, the, you know, one of the unique features of this whole uh, you know, exercise has been harnessing technology. And that is something also which with appropriate safeguards, I think can show us the way even in the TV context. Let me elaborate on what I mean by that, right? So for example, uh, one of the ways in which, you know, if, first of all, you know, anytime you call somebody, you will get a warning message about, um, you know, what, uh, about, uh, you know, about COVID and things like that, but, um, and uh, links to places where websites say, so oh, you can get more information. But more interestingly, um, uh, you know, the, the, there have been a number of apps that have been developed. And while there may be concerns about privacy and other issues, the fact of the matter is that, um, uh, you know, we are in a situation today where the vast majority of the population has access to some kind of a mobile phone, right? So, so this now gives us an opportunity to keep engaged uh, with, you know, patients even in the, in the TV context, right? Just like we've been able to do in the, in the COVID context. So if uh, we can think about what ways are, you know, and that will allow us to monitor, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, follow-ups to monitor, um, uh, to stay in touch when, uh, you know, when there are disruptions like, like the lockdown, you know, there's so many different ways. So one of the things, I think one of my larger learnings from this whole experience is that we need to start thinking about um, patient privacy protective uh, uh, you know, uh, measures, including technology-based measures that could enable us to change the way we work with um, patients and communities in the tuberculosis context. That's one. The second is that um, uh, you have, uh, absolutely you need uh, frontline workers well-trained and uh, constantly alert to engaging. And, and you need to make sure that they are also well rewarded for the risks that they're uh, taking. And this is something that's come out in the COVID context as well. Along with all that, you saw the you know, governments at every level and uh, really stepping up uh, to, to, and essentially coming up with um, initiatives, with uh, crack teams, et cetera, that uh, you know, enabled response. And um, even in you know, very vulnerable areas like Dharavi, you saw that what seemed like a powder keg, something that was going to explode, actually was managed in a more, um, uh, you know, in a more uh, manageable manner or something like that. And in that context, I, you know, we have to. That, that, that's a heartening lesson. That you know, similar, you know, those sorts of settings are also where um, uh, TB patients are most vulnerable. Where uh, non-TB patients are vulnerable to exposure to TB, right? So, so, so these are all the lessons from. Uh, the um, COVID context that if, uh, you know, if, if the will is there, if the government structures come together, if uh, the priority is given, if technology is harnessed, if resources are put together and training kicks in, et cetera, that you would be in a position to really harness the lessons from COVID and apply them in the tuberculosis context and really make a dent in, uh, you know, in this uh, you know, horrific lifelong uh, threat that we've been enduring in India. Um, that said, I would say that um, uh, you know, uh, we have to make sure that you know, some of those other concerns that were also there in the COVID context, stigma, um, uh, you know, and, and isolation and things of that sort. Um, uh, those don't affect people's livelihood opportunities that we ensure that nutrition and access to healthcare, all those things are somehow provided. So we might, well, the system needs to 
figure out how to respond to these things. But you know, with personal private uh, protective equipment, all the sort of things becoming routine now, I think um, uh, you know, and, and even mask wearing becoming more routine. It um, there is quite a bit of um, uh, application, you know, lessons that we can learn from the COVID experience and harness to the TV context. Thank you, Dr. Gora. I completely agree. And I think COVID-19 has taught us that if we can come together to address something that we were unprepared for globally, I think there are definitely lessons to learn. And hopefully we will put them to use uh, as we go towards the goal of elimination. Uh, with that, I'll actually like to turn to real life accounts. As Dr. Gora was talking about vulnerable populations, ensuring we reach them. Uh, Mr. Chandan is with, here with us. He is a TV champion. And uh, Mr. Chandan, I want to turn to you and as someone who has experienced tuberculosis firsthand, could you tell us a little bit about how the journey has been for you and what is the role the community has played in this journey for you? Yeah, hi, Sukriti. Uh, yeah, first of all, you know, good evening to all the handsome gentlemen and beautiful ladies. Uh, you know... <laughs> Uh, it took some time. Uh, so myself, Chandan, sorry. And uh, thanks for all the, thanks for our opportunity for all the dignities in the panelists and to the community. So uh, it took some time for me, you know, to confirm that I have a TB. Uh, when you consider my journey, because I went for hospital uh, for COVID and later, you know, undergone many uh, test and later ultrasonic uh, ultrasonic test mri scan and finally one of the uh, orthopedics suggested me since the tb which i got is a bone tb so then one of the orthopedic doctors suggested me that you have to undergo a surgery immediately so then that is where i admitted to hospital for a surgery and uh, since it is a known doctor he you know he took uh, advice from another neurosurgeon and then he avoided the surgery and then they thought that it can be curable through tablets only. Uh, you know, from there, uh, so that started the treatment. And later when I went for the first checkup, then the one of the doctors suggested me, suggested me that the government is providing, uh, you know, free medicine for this. Till then I was not, uh, literally I was not aware of any of the benefits that the government is providing. So then uh, in my local area, and they suggested you need to search around your area where you can find the uh, centers for this TB. Uh, so when I Googled it and... Uh, and then I came to know in my area called as uh, Konan Kunta in Bangalore. Then I spoke with one of the, you know, supervisor of TB and then Mahadev, his name. And then he came, uh, then I came to know that this is a lot of benefits. And, you know, the government has taken a proper uh, way, you know, for the patients uh, to recover from that. So then I came to know that, that they're conducting many, you know, TB campaigns and TB championship uh, awareness and all. But here, what I have felt is that the sad part is that when I was in hospital, when I asked for the doctors, uh, because I was uh, I, around in 10th standard or I don't know, I uh, read about this TB. I thought it's a old disease and I didn't know that still it is existing in India. So it took some, it took some time for me, you know, to digest that still I have TB. But no doctors has provided me a proper information uh, that why it will come, how it will spread, in what all ways it can be uh, avoided or it will spread. So again, I googled myself and took some YouTube videos to understand why it will come, how it may affect, what are the different types. So, you know, after, you know, attending the mini TB championship and awareness programs, I was very happy that, you know, government has taken already many initiatives and, uh, you know, uh, they're trying to eradicate this uh, TB permanently. So, uh, you know, I was very happy on that. So after that, you know, continue to take on medicine on a regular basis and now still under medication, but it is much, much far better than the previous one. So at this point, since all the, you know, dignities in the panelists, I would 
like to suggest some of the points which where i felt some challenges and uh, see i think uh, through web- this webinar we were discussing you know many you know points how to take this forward but even though you have taken many initiative there are programs uh, somewhere uh, somewhere else i am feeling you no know, it has not reached to all the people that is where the gap you know exist between this government or the public so what i said su- i mean it's just a suggestion from my end see uh, in daily you know activities where we are in so there are in tvs we see multiple advertisements right which may are may, may be useful or not useful but uh, i feel that if uh, advertisements has been given saying that at least uh, where in india you can see most of the people are middle class fam- families you know they think twice to go for an hospitals because we never know what kind where it will lead so if at least uh, you can uh, create awareness through tv advertisements where uh, just to you know to inform them that uh, there is a free uh, medicines or some facilities or benefits from the government then they will not uh, think twice uh, uh, to reach out to the people because if they are thinking meanwhile they might have spread to some other people uh, since it is a uh it this disease may transfer from one people to another people so i think yeah that's what i feel from my side uh definitely it's left to the decision makers uh i know but after coming to know this all these programs i'm happy uh but see i i understand that everything is there uh in our fingertips nowadays and we can search Uh, but are, that there are some limitations where common people can also get these benefits and maybe when they go for treatment you know the doctors can you know they encourage them and they should feel hope uh, i feel that along with medicines the mental support or the mental confidence when the patients get you no know, they will try to recover the faster on, uh, along with the medicines so uh, you know i some of the doctors are good but some of the doctors you know they'll treat the patients in a different way so maybe in some point doctors also you know has to encourage or they should guide uh, the patients because what i felt is that even uh, the tb treatment food matters a lot because uh, when they give the proper nutrition food or when we take definitely it will help us you know for the faster recovery so when they go for a treatment definitely this kind of guidelines is required from the doctors as well so that even by chance if people are infected from this disease definitely it will help us for a faster recovery that's what i felt and thanks for the opportunity thank you so much uh, chandan and uh, we are truly honored to have you with us and i think on the entire panel your voice is what is most important of course we are all coming from areas of expertise but we are actually looking at you and many more uh, champions to tell us what should be the way forward and i just want to come in and add one thing decision makers like dr singh dr gowda are very important but it is the community that needs to tell us what it needs and i think uh, we are finally listening we i don't think we were listening enough and i just hope your voice becomes stronger louder and we are here to support you on that journey with that i'm going to turn uh, to the last question uh, to dr luchika before we open it up uh, for the audience q and a dr luchika i just uh, finished uh, you know in telling chandan that you know voices like yours should grow i want to understand your opinion on you know importance of having these voices and how do you think in the current situation research for tb can evolve to support the ones who are most in need So first of all I really want to thank you Chandan for your story and for the advice. <clears throat> I I think uh, I agree very much to what you said Sukriti that I don't know if we were listening enough. You see historically because some of you are in this some of us are here in this business for longer time. But there are people that are in this for a much shorter time and you know in TB the TB response was in general constructed from with good uh, love and uh, support from a lot of the medical uh, groups you know it was a medicalized answer i don't want to see just doctors or nurses but in general was very medicalized and was not bad will it was a lot of uh, trying to help but nobody nobody can put themselves into the shoes 
of the ones that suffer or are sick, we cannot imagine uh, without having uh, gone through the disease, what it means, what are the fears, what are the obstacles, what are the challenges, as much as we want to help. I am infected with TB, I'm not sick, but I am infected. And the moment you start thinking about it, I tell you, you have different shoes, even though if you know what it means, leave aside what Chandan said that sometimes, you know, it's not enough that the information is available, it needs a bit more. So for me, this is essential and that's why um, and I know it's not easy because the, the medical uh, approach was not, we, people, we are not trained in the medical stuff like that, in which you have to listen to the ultimate client to say so, to see what he or she wants. And, you know, you have to adapt to their request and that there might come uh, things that we might not even imagine. So I remember once that I was, for me, like a very cold shower was I was in Bangalore, actually. And we were speaking about creating an app to go from doctor the moment the diagnosis for TB is coming to just go as a WhatsApp, uh, uh, sorry, as an SMS to everyone that gets a diagnosis saying you were diagnosed with TB. And uh, we were, you know, it's obviously from a medical point of view is good because there's no delay between diagnosis and treatment and obviously telling the, the person where to go, right? You were diagnosed with TB, please go to this dispensary. But then, thanks God, we had few colleagues, a uh, few people uh, that uh, were affected by TB, few communities there. We actually said, it was several years ago, I think it was probably seven years ago or eight years ago, said, well, we think this is all good, but imagine if we receive this kind of message, how scared we will be. To whom do we go to speak? To whom do we go to ask more details? How do we get more, you know? So something that was initially, so like that was also the entire you know, I don't want to go into a discussion now, the entire dots, you know, which is a, a, a great principle, right? You cannot uh, create more uh, drug resistant TB. So you need the system in which the, the person with TB is supported, observed, taking the treatment. But putting it, uh, as you recall, uh, we were all doing it, right? To come to the dispensary every other day or, or every day was an an incredible burden. And that didn't come obviously from enough discussion with people affected saying, guys, if we ask you to go to the dispensary every day, is this something that you would think is feasible? Because people would have been like, no way. So I think, so it's very important that we uh, listen. And that this is the point that was made uh, repeatedly, having uh, the champions, having the survivors, uh, not only invited to meetings to speak, but also enabled to speak. Because you see, if, if it's, uh, and I have many examples, you have one person that is affected, invited in a group of technicals. He, he or she will not be very comfortable in standing up and speaking unless it's properly invited, empowered, engaged and trained and so on. So, so we have some way to go. On, on the TV research piece, you see for TV research, on tools, on everything. As well, we need to have the, 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 sort of the communities uh, to provide the feedback and to also to be engaged in this entire dialogue because we might all go ahead and in, invent a tool that might be awesome, but people might be like, I don't want to use it. I'm sorry about it, you know? Uh, you know, it's, it's completely, it's great, but no. Uh, so that's why uh, we need so we need to have this dialogue and we need to have people engaged and part of this. And what we try to do from Stop TB, and we have conversations with different uh, networks of uh, people, the TB people, we have uh, the new tools working groups that uh, with whom we speak as well, uh, colleagues from FIND as well, uh, is it's increased the literacy level for people that are the, the TB literacy, right? Uh, for uh, people that are communities and civil society, because we, you know, if you have a debate on, on a research, on a new diagnosis or a new vaccine, you can invite civil society and community, but if you didn't train or explain in advance, what is it about? They will be there. They will be keen to provide the knowledge, but they will not be fully, you know, like uh, they will not know what is this about, you know? So we are trying to go ahead and see how we can do this kind of training about uh, at scale about uh, TB literacy, because in TB, we don't have that, you know, HIV literacy, you have a lot of people being able to speak very easy at HIV. In TB, we didn't have, I have to say the luxury of having enough funds to go to these aspects because we always try to run with very limited funds, cut there, cut there. So, but my, I will uh, stop here because my, my strongest, um, how to say, 
uh, view is that uh, it's absolutely essential uh, to uh, not, not absolutely essential, it's, it's essential that we have the people that are affected and the, the communities also, they might be the same, but they might be also different, engaged uh, in the dialogue beyond, and this is what I told to my team in Stop TV, if we invite survivors, uh, like is very good as you did today, is to tell their story, but to also have them provide some feedback. And that's what exactly Chandan said. He said, you know, this is my story, but let me tell you some things I learned that this is some things that I would like you to do. And I think the more we try to do that, the better it is. I want to tell you that it's not comfortable because usually people are, are, are faced with crazy things happening to them, uh, things that we don't even realize exist. India is a huge country. I'm trying to explain to people because we are very impressed with the leadership of Prime Minister Modi and of Minister Harshvardhan because India is the highest burden country and the political leaders here are amazing. And of course, I have a lot of colleagues and survivors and people with TB that come back and point to us and to me, one thing there, one thing there. I mean, they are happening and there will be bad things happening and there will be disaster answers and so on. But as far as we know, and we are keen to address them, there is a hope uh, forward because uh, at, at the country as in, it happens in smaller countries like mine to have people that are not paid attention to waiting hours on the corridors, people that are treated with wrong regimens. It's happening in my country, which is 18 million dollars, million people, uh, 18 million people. So. I'm sure it happens in India. It should not discourage us. It should just be like, okay, but do we have the will to address these things? And uh, we are looking at India as our example, as our model country globally. So it has to work well. So thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. Thank you, Sukriti, and thank you, everyone. And thank you, Chandan, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dityu. And uh, yes, India is in the forefront and we also hope that we can find the solutions working together with organizations like Stop TV Partnership. We have about 12 minutes to go. Uh, there are multiple questions, but I'm going to ask about two to three because I would like us to end in time. Um, Dr. Gora, the first question is for you. What steps can the government take to promote decentralized actions to ensure access to health as a right at the grassroots for TB and beyond? And what would your vision be for that? Actually, this is a beautiful point because ultimately the concept of healthcare as a right needs to be um, imbued across uh, the population and uh, especially also across different levels of government. So the real challenge is um, you know, training and empowering the front line. Right. I mean, when you think about the three tiers of democracy, we always keep thinking about parliament at the top. But actually, it starts uh, the first tier is really um, at the ground. And that's where now, you know, we, we're talking about moving funds, functions, functionaries, you know, decentralizing and empowering um, the Panchayati Raj institutions. But it's not just the political or the developmental side, it's also these other dimensions that can ensure that, um, uh, that communities actually play an active role in, um, uh, in you know, improving healthcare indicators across domains. We've already seen, for example, in the maternal and um, uh, you know, child healthcare sector, how Anganwadis have become the centers for, um, uh, you know, for multiple health interventions. So similarly, we need to think about what would be the structure, what would be the public health interface with uh, populations, and how do you ensure that um, uh, the, the frontline uh, entities are, uh, are, are trained and strengthened? How do you ensure that there is technology that is integrated so that, um, uh, you know, whatever is available to the best, um, uh, you know, the best knowledge and medical knowledge that is available should also be accessible by people in every village, in every public health center. So these are all entirely possible if we dream in that manner, if we go ahead and translate the dream into an actual reality. This is frankly nothing stopping us. It's not even that expensive. It's just a question of um, uh, you know, brainstorming and uh, putting in place the kinds of measures that will make that uh, frontline um, uh, you know, become the line where we stop the further progress of any disease, dreaded disease like tuberculosis. Thank you, sir. 
just from that point, uh, Dr. Singh, there's a question for you uh, from our listeners who have joined in from Bihar. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, there are special social welfare schemes like direct benefit transfers that exist. But the question is that, you know, many vulnerable TB patients who have completed their treatment still don't receive these uh, benefits from the schemes. How do you think we can respond to that from a policymaker's perspective? I think uh, in our organization, we, well, I began with two members of parliament. Today, I'm supported by three dozen of them. We also have taken on board at least nine uh, assembly constituents and also we got percolating down to even uh, cooperators at various levels. But I'm sure that if there is a problem about disbursement or the problem about his transfers, he can report to the district TB officer, or a TB officer in a particular area. If he doesn't find, I'm sure he can report to the MLA or the cooperator he has in his area. He can even write to us directly. There is no problem because we have access to the government. And if it's a one-off case, so here is one-off case. I mean, I, I, it doesn't generalize everything. But as in, a, in a particular region or a constituency, it's something very routine. And uh, we have been talking on it during our meetings, whenever we have met our own parliamentarian, the policy makers, or that matter, all the stakeholders come together. So I will take this upon as one of the points which I must share with the government, that there are, there are such leakages in uh, many, many of the areas. And let's see what government has to say. But he must contact the uh, TB officer in his own particular area. Thank you, sir. Uh, also, to the listeners, I'll encourage you to also write to uh, the Global Coalition Against TB's email, uh, if, if Dr. Singh is fine with that, and share your concerns, because it is a platform where we want to come together to address the issues. Thank you, sir. Uh, my last question to uh, Dr. Dityu. Uh, there is an attendee who's asked us, uh, how has funding support enhanced for community initiatives and structures over a period of time? And do you think it's effective? Yes, the answer is both yes. Um, the, um, uh, the amount of funding going to communities, I can tell you at least from the Stop TP side and somehow from the Global Fund side, um, it increased for us, uh, at least the challenge facility and the TB reach. As I told you, for the last rounds, uh, we are accepting just communities and uh, applicants from the high burden countries, which is really great. Uh, for us, the level of funding that we are pushing outside the door is much bigger for communities and civil society. Uh, is it enough? Absolutely not. But we start from kind of almost negative figures to say so, you know, so it's a, it's a very small increase. So sometimes if you quote by percentage, you can say a hundred percent increase, but that can be from $1 to $2, which is like nothing. So uh, the, the increase is big, but it's absolutely not enough. It is efficient. Um, I think uh, from what we see ourselves, from what we have the tools to measure, it's absolutely efficient, yes. And it is also cost efficient. But you see, the, the challenge that I want to put to all of us is that what we see, at least from Stop TV, because that's our size and our mandate, we see what we call pilot projects or we, we see projects. You see, we see working in a little community we, uh, or several, but we don't see things at scale. And I don't say necessarily at scale India wide, but I'm saying even in a, in a district or in a, in a county, let's put it this way, to have uh, an increase. That's why I say that. Uh, uh, I was discussing the other day with somebody about this idea of having communities and the survivors prepared to be the, uh, how to say, they, they should be the ones deblocking uh, the, the, the mindsets of people, helping and encouraging them to be tested, following their treatment and so on, which I think uh, in India is happening in some parts. And people are like, oh, we can do that. We have community, we, have, we can engage. So I say, okay, how many? Oh, we can deploy 20 people. So I say, okay, that is great, but, uh, and it will show that it works, but from 20, we need to go to thousands. Even, I'm not even speaking in, I'm speaking in general. If you really wanna make a difference, it's, it's time to, to go at a bigger scale. And this is my, in a way, not only frustration, but the difficulty, because to go at that scale, you need a different type of investments and you need obviously a complete buy-in from the government, you know? And um, again, this is a general observation. In some places it's easier. And I know for sure that in India, there is that opening. 
In other places is not. We have a country in which we struggle with the fact that they say community health workers should be volunteers and paid nothing. So it's like, no, sorry. If you ask them to go house to house and discuss and encourage and take people to treatment or support them during treatment TB or COVID even, you really need to send them pro properly equipped and paid. But we will begin to have that conversation because I, all, uh, you know, there is no other way uh, engaging uh, communities as well as in some places, let's be also honest, private sector, because we cannot neglect that angle, especially in Asia. It's a different conversation, obviously, but these things will pay much more because, you know, I am here in Geneva and for me, I am trying to go to a doctor myself here, okay, with my son. I'm Romanian, they always ask a lot of details about the past and so on, and I'm not very comfortable, right? But they are saying that they will deploy a little clinic here in Paki where I live. I will be more comfortable to go here, which is so close to me, you know, and maybe my neighbors or my some people from the building will be involved, so I will feel much more comfortable. So having these things in mind, the future will actually have to be at that level. It will not be in big hospitals in which people will be crowded on corridors and so on. The, the future will be as closer as possible to the person that is affected. And that will be through communities. There might be other ways, but our the main pine port is communities and civil society here. So yeah, thank you. I will have to disconnect now and I'm sorry because I have to do something else at one Geneva time here, but Thank you so much. Because... No problem at all. We are anyways going to take a minute to close out. Uh, thank you for being with us, Dr. Ditio. As always, so inspiring. And uh, we will walk this path with you till we eliminate TB. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to take a minute to request uh, Ms. Mamta to just uh, deliver the note of thanks. And before that, uh, just maybe take away this thought that, you know, we unite to NTB and the purpose is to leave no one behind. So Mamta, over to you to close us out, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sukruti. Uh, good evening, all. I would like to thank all the experts and the participants who have taken the time out for this important focus discussion. I would like to acknowledge all the efforts put in by USCD and KHPT in curating this discussion this session on understanding the role of community structures in stopping the TB cascade in our country. KHPT, as you are aware, is committed to empower the vulnerable communities amongst us. And today's discussion has thrown light on the rights of the people, gender sensitive approach, stigma reduction, sensitivity among service providers, and the importance of resources required for community engagement. And, and it was also brought to the fore the challenges faced by the various marginal population. And it has highlighted the critical role of community structures in reaching out to the larger community. I, I hope that this, this discussion proves to be the stepping stone towards our collective goal of eliminating TB by 2025. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Gaurav. Thank, thank you, Dr. Singh. Radiv, Sukriti, Mamta, Ruben. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all.